Welcome to Clothing Culture, a fashion industry podcast at the intersection of technology and innovation. I'm Emily Lane. And I'm Brett Schnitger. We speak with experts and disruptors who are moving the industry forward. And discuss solutions to real industry challenges. Clothing Culture is brought to you by Stars Design Group, a global design and production house with more than 30 years of experience. Welcome back to another episode of Clothing Culture. We continue our journey in the great city of New York City and have another amazing conversation lined up, don't we, Brett? Yes, we do. You're pretty excited about this one. Yeah, well, you know, we we met Josh, what is it? It seems like a couple weeks ago, but I think it's probably a couple couple months months ago. ago, Time (laughs) fly, COVID time. But uh, we we had a fascinating dialogue, and so you guys better just buckle up because it's going to go on and on. We're going to go short and stop. We're just going to keep going because I don't know, it's... Great dialogue. Right. Well, Joshua Williams, beyond being a talented musician and, um, you know, started in the theater, as we learned early on, which we contemplated actually opening this segment with music today, but <laughs> we're sparing everyone here. The, the, the initial thing that drew us to Josh was um, his experience as an award-winning fashion uh, creative director. He's a fellow podcaster with a wonderful podcast called Retail Revolution. Also does the Fashion Consort News Bites with uh, Fashion United. As very celebrated in this new realm of education that he's taking on, working as an associate professor of fashion management at Parsons. Huge advocate of technology and innovation in the industry. I could go on and on and on, but maybe we should just start talking to the guy. What do you think? <laughs> well, he's here. Yeah. <laughs> so. Sounds good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, welcome, Joshua. Thank you. <laughs> it's such a pleasure to be here. <laughs> so I kind of want to just get a little quick... Uh, I, I, you know, beyond the introduction I just shared, I, I asked you early on when we first met today, but I'd love for you to share what got you into fashion. Well, I think that it was always, I was always interested in using art as a way to express who I was and also to tell stories. So I think, you know, I was saying earlier to all of you that um, I did that through music, I did it through theater, and I did it through shopping. <laughs> <laughs> And I resemble that. Through shopping, yeah. <laughs> so I think that's how a lot of us start. But but just realizing that you could go to the store and pick out an outfit and kind of put it together in a way that was perhaps unique or different than everyone else, and and that said something about you. And and I grew up in the '80s, so there was a lot of exciting things happening uh, in fashion at the time. And I think it was. It, it definitely stuck with me because I, I moved into the kind of Parachute theater. pants stuck with you? <laughs> oh, you know Come it. Come on, Josh. They're coming back, hey. <laughs> You know it. I, I saved every dime I could to get, you know, some parachute pants That's at so Mervyn's, funny. I think. Yeah. <laughs> but... <laughs> But I uh, ended up in the theater world and, and realized that, that it's such a, a difficult place to sort of uh, be heard and ultimately ended up working in production, direction, and fashion. And that's sort of where the creative direction came, came together. Yeah, yeah it's, an, you know, it's an amazing dynamic time. We talked about this quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, being involved in some educational initiatives that, that I've been involved in, my soapbox has always been, look, things are changing so fast. Mm-hmm. Is education keeping up? And I think that that was kind of a hot topic when we talked last time. Right. Fill us in about your history as you shifted from, you know, all of these creative things that you're doing into education. Because for a lot of people, that's kind of like, <laughs> hey, it's a pivot. It's a big, huge change. Because yeah, yeah. you're now, you know, having to embrace the next generation, wanting to embrace the next generation, perhaps, um, and, and teach them as opposed to, you know, the entrepreneurial path and doing all this. Some people are doing it consecutively. You yeah. mentioned you're doing all these things at once. Yeah. And but the challenges today are that that technology and its influence on fashion is accelerating at a pace that I think challenges educational institutions today. Right. Yeah, it's true. I mean, <clears throat> one of the things because of my career, um, because I've been in so many different areas and I sort of had to train myself and I realized very quickly that there was a lot of crossover between theater, for example, and fashion. There was a lot of, uh, between theater and retail. I mean, retail is theater in many ways. And we talk a lot about experiential retail now. But um, so I had to sort of train myself and I realized that there wasn't a lot of places to do that. Um, And so I had to figure it out on my own. So I would go out and, and meet people and get mentored wherever I could. 
And I realized uh, that there was a lot of information lacking on the academic side of things. Um, ultimately went and got my master's degree. And as I was joking with you earlier, in some cases realized I knew more than the teachers in a graduate program. Yep. Well, and because you had real yeah, practical experience. Exactly, yeah. And, you know, in the early days of e-com in particular, direct-to-consumer, we had to, I mean, we had no idea what we were doing. Yeah, right. <laughs> Zero. Yeah. I mean, you have a whole brand new technology that we're sort of trying to figure out how it works in a retail space. For most of us, we were marketing or creative directors because it wasn't even considered a retail channel at the time. It was not sales. It was this weird thing that maybe we should try out. Yeah, right. Um, and so it's interesting because a lot of people say, oh, well, you grew up in retail. I mean, I, I didn't other than I was shopping as a kid. Sure. But I had to figure that out and realize very quickly that there's a lot of crossover. It's very cross-disciplinary, I think, fashion. And that's what kind of drew me to the academic realm is how do we take somebody who learned, you know, theater and music, you know, sort of in the, in the academic space and ultimately worked in fashion. And by the way, I'm not the only one, right? There's yeah, you. No, yeah, right, <laughs> you, absolutely. Both for music. Yeah. Um, but how to, how to transition that and help students sort of make that transition um, into what I think uh, in terms of fashion has become much more corporate and much more business and much more global. So the stakes are much higher than they were in the 80s yeah. in many cases. But yeah. there's this nice, <laughs> fresh, new injection of boutique brands. Yes, absolutely. Visionaries that are out there. And, you know, I, I did come up through corporate retail, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And years ago, you know, there was just a way you did it. You know, you had brick and mortar, you had, you know, seasonal launches, you looked at open to buys, you know, sell off, you know, is all this traditional methodology that today is radically different. One, it provides a lot of opportunity for people that are in this space and creatives to recognize a niche and exploit that niche. And I don't mean in a negative way, just, mm -hmm. you know, you know, being able to converse more directly with an audience than you were able to do before. Right. Um, but in addition to that, it's just, I think it creates a bunch of challenges because from the education point of view, and I'm really glad you are pioneering and championing this in, in the schools, is that there is so many other elements to e-commerce entrepreneurialism, the ability for a designer that's got a vision to be able to go out and communicate with audiences there, but they've got to know how to do it. And so many of them, I mean, when I started much like you, you know, music, theater, art, it was all these extensions of creative outlets, you know, the last thing I really wanted to deal with is technology mm -hmm. and numbers and, <laughs> right? you know, the business plan. You know, when I mentor a lot of these kids today, you know, they, they would you be my mentor? And they're now like, you're my tormentor because, <laughs> you know, you push me on all these, you know, financial things. And I think the framework today is important from an education platform. But I think the challenge is it's moving at such a pace. Yeah. Do the educators... Are the educators able to keep up with that pace? But then when it comes to curriculum planning, to get that curriculum kind of placed in the system, the minute it's placed in the system, it's almost outdated. How is yeah. how are schools today, fashion schools, you know, what are you seeing behind the scenes mm. where they're trying you to, you know, manage your Yeah. It I think it, it, there's a little history here that I think is worthwhile. I, you know, fashion education is a unique thing first and foremost because fashion was vocational in many ways and it, was, and it covered a lot of different realms. I mean, fashion is design, it's merchandising, it's buying, it's marketing, yeah. it's, it's business, it's financials. Right. So Trend analysis. It's, it's pretty <laughs> hard to go to school and learn all of those things. Yeah. Uh, so what typically would happen sort of pre-1990s is you'd go to school and they'd try to teach you a certain area. Like, okay, you're going to be a merchant, so we're going to focus yeah. on retail math, we're going to focus on that type of thing. And then you'd get really compartmentalized in that yeah. area. Well, that wasn't very useful because as the industry started to become much more complex and globalized, you have to have an understanding of what you're buying and what the, the uh, issues are related to the supply chain, which we know mm. oh so well right now. Yeah. You can't just buy something. It doesn't magically appear. Um, and then, of course, you have all these other issues of sustainability and technology. And so it requires people who work in this industry to understand the bigger picture. Um, and certainly fashion companies, I don't think, or fashion educators were doing that. So in the 1990s, there was a real push to create more what I call sort of the liberal arts fashion education, right? So it went from, hey, going to FIT for two years and getting an associate's in merchandising and then going to Macy's or Bloomingdale's and then learning on the job, so to speak, because they had their own training programs, is that you would go and get a four-year degree. 
Now, of course, parents all over the country are like, okay, well, now my kid's getting a four-year degree, they're getting a bachelor's degree, that makes it all official. But the trade-off was, is in any institution, that means you're only getting six or seven, eight maybe classes in your major fashion, maybe an elective or two, but then you're taking biology and math and all these things. One way to look at this is, an, uh, is a liberal arts education is great because it gives people a big point of view. It gives them um, a lot of knowledge in a lot of different areas so that the hope is they can go into the industry and, and be thoughtful leaders and critical thinkers and collaborators. So I'm a big believer in that. But on the flip side of that, what it means is, is you graduate from an undergraduate program and you have like 101 classes in everything. You're yeah. not, you don't know, you don't have any skills. Yeah. Um, and so there's become this imbalance, so to speak, between sort of this goal of the liberal arts, well-rounded education, get a degree versus what are the skills you actually need to get into a job? I was thinking as you were talking earlier, you know, when I first got my first job in fashion, it was in e-com, um, in retail. And first of all, I was hired because I was a marketing person. And second of all, I was hired because I was young. Ish <laughs> compared to everyone else. Same with me. Right. They were like, hey, you want to get in the fashion business? I'm like, I want advertising and marketing. They're like, no money in that in our company. Get into the right. fashion business. I was like, okay, we'll okay. give it a shot. Yeah. And so I remember the first day they, they walked in and they said, so by the way, you're also the photographer for all of our e-com shoots. So I said, I've never done photography in my entire life. So I got a $4,000 camera they gave me and I had to go teach myself how to be a photographer. Um, you know, and that's, I, I laugh about that, but that's not so abnormal in fashion. You walk into a job and all of a sudden you're doing something that you had no idea even existed. And guess what? It's cyclical. It used to be you did everything. Yeah. You were like this solo entrepreneur in these massive organizations mm -hmm. responsible for categories and sourcing and buying and, you know, even down to photography, right? Right. And then departments expanded. You know, I would have interviews with people like from some of these big department stores. And I'm the button buyer. I'm like, seriously? <laughs> the button buyer? I mean, that's pretty niche. <laughs> and now with everything that's occurring in the evolution of our industry, it's kind of going back to sizes are shrinking. That's They're doing right. a lot more. You've got to be capable across a lot of different categories. Well, what happened in many ways too is that because fashion got so corporatized, especially in the 80s and 90s, and it became a very global industry, it became very compartmentalized. You were just the sock buyer or the yeah. button buyer. You just sourced, or button, the button you know, buyer, yeah. Which, I don't know, <laughs> no, I mean, I knew, a, I knew a sock buyer, and I was like, that's all you do yeah. for 15 years? You oh. buy yeah. socks? Yeah. <laughs> like, this sounds so exciting. You gotta be really uh, passionate about yeah. socks. We um, have an opening for ties, exactly. but unfortunately, you've been You're in socks. Buyer, yeah. You're in hosiery, <laughs> men's hosiery. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh God, yeah. black, maybe. Yeah. Right, you just get so excited when stripes yeah. are in, right? Yeah. Um, so you're right, so I became corporatized and what I found in the education space is a lot of students came in and said, oh, I don't want to work for that. I actually want to start my own business because of that. They, were, yeah. they didn't want to work in that corporate environment. Yeah. And of course the technology had shifted as such that you could now go direct to that consumer three, through e-com and all of a sudden now uh, you have a lot more smaller, much more nimble, flexible businesses. But that means if, if you're a designer who started a business, you're a designer, you're the chief financial yeah, operator, right. officer, you are probably sourcing everything on your own. Maybe yeah. you have a team of two or three people, but right. now all of a sudden these students are coming back and saying, I can't just be a, a merchandiser. Yeah. Like no. I have to know the whole entire thing. Right. Yeah. We're back at a point now where the number one thing people don't want to know, but absolutely need to know is financials. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> I say yeah. that to, you know, again, when we're mentoring it, I said, you know, I hated numbers. Mm. I have learned over the years to dramatically respect numbers. Mm -hmm. You know, you, mm -hmm. you know, your stories, left brain or right brain, right? you've got to have a little bit of both. As much as your passion is for creativity, you can be creative in numbers and numbers will speak to you and help drive decisions and help avoid mistakes. Yes. You just have to stay awake. That's you know, right. To some of those yeah. classes. Well, there's been a dynamic shift since that era of corporatized fashion. You know, we have, you, you've talked in the past, Brett, about how you know the the fashion industry used to say this is what you're wearing this yeah, is what you right. want and we've really seen that shift it's um, a consumer driven economy absolutely yeah. and so that in itself i'm sure creates new challenges on the education yeah. side information as well. technology it does, is yeah, critical yeah. yeah i mean the number one job right now in fashion is is information te yes, technology right. and data analytics it is the number one thing people don't come to fashion school for <laughs> right. but probably should but probably should absolutely and then of course the number one thing that people 
students will cite is, is interesting is sustainability, but at the heart of sustainability is understanding how to make that profitable because if you're not running a business that's profitable, then you're oh, not sustainable. Right. right. You know, right. I've said in a previous podcast, I think last year out of the, what, 111 million metric tons of fiber that was produced last year, only 13% is available and sustainable. Right. And it's expensive and people just think, oh, let's just shift to sustainable. Demand f- would far exceed supply. That's right. And it's, you know, I, I was in a uh, there was a graduating class and they were doing their final portfolios mm-hmm. and presentations. And some would really embrace sustainability, I mean, to the nth degree. Mm-hmm. And you're looking at it, you're going, it's not super attractive right. because the fabrications were so narrowly limited. Mm-hmm. And while it was exciting that they were using cactus leather, you know, <laughs> you might not piece that with some, you know, piece of linen. It was just, you know, the weight was wonky. Right. It just looked kind of, you know, unattractive. And yeah. so... The ability to understand the evolution and, and the proper use of sustainability and realizing there's three pillars, people, planet, profit, you've got to be able to digest all those different things. Or I think it's an important part of the education. Today. It really is. And I work a lot in the graduate space, both in design and, and on sort of on the business side. And one of the things I'll do with my design students um, is I'll walk them through a piece that they're creating for their collection. And we'll actually literally figure out how much time they spent on creating it, make sure that they've costed out every single material. Because as a student, you don't do that. You're like, okay, I have $600. Yeah, (laughs) right. (laughs) Right? My time is my time, and I'm not even going to think about that. And by the time they start to calculate the cost of that sweater, right, that they're not going to go sell, they realize it's $2,000 it cost. And I said, okay, so how much are you going to sell that? Well, I'll sell it for $2,000, so you're not going to make any money on that. Exactly. Right? That's so funny. Okay, well, so let's mark it up. You know, for wholesale to a right. potential boutique, we're already talking three, four thousand dollars minimum, right. right? Now, all of a sudden, what does that look like at retail? And like, just the minds that are blown at that moment that yes. realize that yeah. they were designing with zero idea of how it was going to connect back into the world is kind of astounding, right? But this is typical also in education, especially on the design side, where we give students sort of the world, like just go do whatever you want, which yep. is amazing. Yeah. But there's no context for then what that means if they're going to go out into the world and start a brand. Right. Right. You can't have an $800 sweater as a young designer at cost. Right. Yes. Unless right. you have some really great clients. That's built right. Into you can. It. It's you just, can. You know, takes a while to develop the. You're culture. in a very elite yeah. situation yeah. if you can do that. And, um, but even just having a conversation about costing versus you know final price yeah. is kind of a, a big deal for for a designer. So, you know, the good news is that a lot of schools are starting to incorporate that kind of conversation, basic conversation, into the design process. Because in my mind, that's creativity. Yeah, right. You know, as I said to my students, it's not actually the easy thing is being able to make an $8,000 retail sweater. That's easy. Right. But to make that beautiful sweater for four hundred dollars yes. at retail, Accessible. that's right. exciting, right. right? Because you've turned something beautiful into and something. realize that your time is valuable. That's right. We, I'll use just the first name. We had a wonderful jewelry designer trained in Florence. You know, uh, Teresa, and mm-hmm. we sat down with her, and she's selling. I'm a big wearing retail. one of her pieces. Actually. You are wearing one of her pieces, <laughs> and uh, she was preparing to sell to a large retailer, women's mm-hmm. wear retailer. And she sits down, and she's like, "Well, I'm working on these pieces. They want to do a whole collection, and so I'm like." let's break down the components of cost. Yeah. And I said, you tell me what your component, she lists all the material costs, she lists all those, zero for building. And I'm like, right. you're gonna build this yourself, right? right? How long does that take you to do? Oh, this one's two hours, this one's three hours. Mm-hmm. I'm like, how many are you gonna build? And <laughs> she's like, well, this is what they want to begin with. And I said, you have put nothing in right. for your time and labor. Right. She's like, well, this is the cost that they want. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, you're free, you're making nothing, <laughs> you know? And they don't even think about no, that. I'm like, no idea. you yeah. know, you could go to McDonald's and make more, you know, yeah. no slam on McDonald's, but <laughs> you know, as a designer, you've, you're creating these amazing pieces of art and Your they feel challenged yeah. to put the dollars in, Yeah. you know, for those efforts. And I think that those are really important parts to this we, new world economy. We have, you know, part of what got me into fashion, that was an earlier question, is is the beauty of it, right? Just yeah. the fact that it, it it is an art yeah. form. And I think a lot of students go to school because it's it's art. It is a way to express yourself. But at the end of the day, once you're in the industry, you realize it's first and foremost the business. The yeah. art hopefully comes through in a way that you can sell. I always say to my students, you can make the most beautiful dress in the world. If it doesn't sell, you don't have a business. That's so right. you're out Absolutely of business right. at that point. 
Um, so I think that, you know, there's kind of connecting those dots, especially in fact, and to me this is where it's exciting, is that this is a business and it is artistic. Right. That's where, to me, that's why I love this industry, is that those two things are happening at the same time. Um, and they create a lot of stress and anxiety and all the things, but to me that's where creat creativity comes out of. But the one thing, going back to a question you asked earlier, is I think there was a tendency for a lot of, especially young designers or young people in fashion, to, to think that they can skip steps. Um, and I think in large part that happened because of social media. Like they were seeing people that could post something and all of a sudden were famous. Mm -hmm. They think. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it happened to a handful of people that got quite lucky with that. But in, in general, that is not the narrative, no. right? Or the reality. But what I mean by that is, at the end of the day, you still have to know how to design. Yeah. You still have to know the technical issues of design, even if that's not your focus. You, you do have to understand how a garment is built and then how it's going to be sourced, the materials, and then how it's going to be, again, costed, and then what its final price is. Uh, with technology today, I'm actually finding that that's becoming more important again than ever before. So you take a place like Parsons, which is really more art-driven, so let's let students just imagine anything and then give them a space to build it, to the point where if you're going to start designing in Clo 3D, for example, you actually have to know pattern making. Right. You can't skip that. No, right. <laughs> you know, uh, and there's nothing wrong with just draping a dress, but at the end of the day, if you want to get that, if you want to be at the cutting edge of what fashion design is and you want to be, you know, thinking about what the future is, and by future I mean three to five years in terms of where these companies are going, you're going to have to have some technical design experience. Yeah. You can't just rely on the fact that you can drape a pretty dress. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's another piece that a lot of schools are trying to figure out because technology is difficult because technology is constantly changing. Yeah. As you said earlier, yeah. not only does it take two to three years to get something accredited by a state in order to teach it, but if all of a sudden you're implementing a technology and it takes three years, to, that technology is old in yeah. three years. Right. You know, Clo 3D three years ago was a whole different game yeah. than what's happening today. Uh, so, you know, places like Parsons and FIT are, are teaching that. It's become a really big part of it. But when I say that, it's because they're trying to catch up. It's right. not that they're at the forefront right. of this. Right. Um, there will be, I think, a tipping point to a degree because um, the more students that have access to, to programs like Clo3D will force some of these slower companies to adapt to digital technologies. But um, at, at a certain point, it's going to shift completely to, I think, mostly a digital design world. It will. We were interviewing Valentin Karabanov out of mm -hmm. Israel in one of our episodes. And one of the things that, you know, we talk about a lot is sustainability, its impact on this on this business. And he was he was talking about this designer he was working with, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to create a collection for the runway shows in, in Paris. And the designer was so amazed that he could just creatively explore all these different designs in a digital landscape. Mm -hmm. And the fact that after he could explore that and then create them, he can send all of the patterns directly to the, you know, the, the sample house and they were able to create them. And I think when you even look at sustainability backing up to the design process mm -hmm. and students' ability to afford, you know, you're buying yardage or meterage of fabric, you're buying all the trims, you're doing all these different things. And your processes, you know, creative processes, you you evolve that process. Mm -hmm. You try one, and that doesn't work. You'll do another. Today, in a digital landscape, you can explore all of that without right. spending that that amount, right. and wasting distil material, and wasting right. material, you yeah. know, yeah. and distill it down, and then go down the steps and create it. Well, and you also have. I had an interesting conversation with a, a graduate at, at Parsons, Chanel Bakush, and she's um, she's a creative director. She works at Condé Nast, and and her key thing is is data, which is so interesting because most creative directors are like, you know, I go look at things, I put a mood board together, right. I present it to my clients, and she's like, let's start with your data. Ooh, What's happening on your Instagram? Let's look at exactly where you're getting engagement, how quick you're getting engagement. Is it because of a color? Is it because of a yes. particular mood or whatever? 
Um, and I asked her, you know, does, do you feel like that potentially weighs down on your creativity? And she's like, actually, oh, it, it doesn't. Informs. Because what it does is it informs. Oh, exactly. Wow. I don't have to sit anymore and go, hey, my crazy idea is you have to pay attention. I have Hopefully all the data works, to prove right? Yeah, right. that we can go and take this risk. And yeah. so she's like, I've actually been able to be more risky in my choices as a creative director because of data, yeah. which I think is quite interesting. And, un and have greater faith that there's going to be an audience for it. That's right. Yeah. 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 And it might only, and that's the other key piece, is it might be a small audience, but it doesn't mean that it's a less important audience. There has been a tendency in fashion, especially because of that corporati corporatization that I talked about earlier, to try to do everything for everyone, mm -hmm. right? And that's where a lot of these retailers have gotten into trouble because they became so generalized, and I won't name names, but uh, they, yeah, but we everyone. Know who they are. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can go there and find something, but I choose yeah. not to go there because I'm bored. Yeah. I do want to go into a place, and I always tell my students, I want, I always want to either love something or hate something. I don't want to, um, I don't want to feel milk toast kind. about yes. it. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> They're like milk toast. What's yeah. that? <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, fashion is supposed to provoke, not be everything to everyone, in my opinion. And uh, data allows you to do that because you can say, okay, let's do a smaller campaign that it will provoke this smaller audience. We don't have to necessarily, this isn't our national or global campaign that we're going to use. Uh, and school, going back to the academic piece, unfortunately, what we do is we sort of teach that generalist kind of idea of, hey, marketing is, is you figure out everything and then you have your niches and then you, you know, that sort of thing. But, you know, he, some of these students um, have already figured this out on their own. Um, I'll, you know, for example, I was having a conversation with my brother who is a, an educator in the art space and on the high school level. And he said, I just had a student drop out because there's a million followers on TikTok. And he's like, why do I need to go to school? Yeah. Wow. Well, I already because... have a job. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, we have had conversations with influencers uh -huh. who talk about the fact that, you know, being an influencer is still a business. That's right. So yeah. college can help you learn how to look at those numbers, That's right. look at those trends. That's what my brother said to him. Yes. <laughs> but I sort of wonder if, again, the full circle conversation about liberal arts moving more into a technical design, fo or technical school focus where it's like, look, we're going to focus on specific classes that's going to prepare you for today's, you know, business environment, you know? Yeah. Hell, I didn't know what I wanted to do until I was 34 years old. So, you know, the liberal arts thing worked for me. Yeah. Because it was like, it hey, give me, me an too. overview. Yeah. But today, I think that there is people that are going to a specialty school already believe this is the business, God help them, that they want to get into, right? <laughs> and, uh, and so if they want to get into that business, prepar preparing them in specific targeted classes today, because you're right. Yeah. Some of these guys already have the followers. And if you can say, look, Here's the class that prepares you for technical design. Here's the class that prepares you for manufacturing. Here's the class that prepares you for the entrepreneurship of a small yeah. business and numbers. Analytics. And, yeah. Yeah, right. Well, one thing I think that we can do better on, and then um, I, you know, I keep going back to the same thing in a lot of conversations I'm having with my colleagues, is <clears throat> I do think we, we don't do a good job of teaching the history in the past. And I think we, we sort of dismiss it because fashion moves so f f fast. Uh, I think in our original conversation, we were talking about how, you know, a lot of people are talking about customization as if it's this new thing. Right. And, you know, that literally is how fashion started. It, started. it yeah. was right. custom. Fashion Couture, is very fast in a really big circle. <laughs> right, yeah. right. So, you know, I get students who are like, oh, I think it'd be really amazing to do one-on-one, -on -one, you know, tailoring. And I'm like, so haute couture, right? And right. they'll have a collection, they can come in and look at it, and then we'll customize it. So, yeah. okay, so the same thing Charles Frederick Worth did in the, in the 1870s. You know, and not to say that you need to know that, but I think that it's valuable to understand that it's not that things completely change, it's the tools have changed yeah. and the technology has changed. So for example, customization, it's no longer a one-on-one -on -one in the sense that you have to be in Paris at the atelier yeah, getting right. measured three times before right. you get your piece. You could do that all online. Yeah. But, and I think that's a key part of education is, is that, and, and honestly, we have to make a choice. Do they learn retail math or do they learn history? And we, to retail math for obvious reasons, yes, right? But right. Then, then I have to wonder and they get back into those meetings if they don't have that understanding of what came before them, then they're not really making a fully formed decision. Now on the flip side of that, the thing that I think is m missing in the industry is um, there's a lot of internships, but I, I actually think 
we need to think more about apprenticeships. I mean, yes, I it wasn't 100%. so long ago that it wasn't internships. You would learn on the tra- in the trade, yeah. right? Um, we do that for the more complex educations right. like medicine. Right, right. And, and I, it, it baffles me that we sort of left that behind. Can we have people in retail work 24 hours a day like <laughs> interns in medicine? Sleep on the it's job? Crazy, that would be nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but, you know, it wasn't so long ago that if your father owned a, you know, a button company that you, like, you were on the job from right. day one and you learned yeah. everything about buttons and then maybe you learned about dresses on the job. But it was, you know, there's this, we talk about as mentorship now, but I, I like to think of it more as it has to be more than just telling people and inspiring them, they actually have to learn how to do things. So my my sort of thought is is that you know education is never going to be fast enough to respond to the needs of the fashion industry. So what is it that we can do that it's at the core of critical thinking and collaboration and and making sure that they have a foundation? But then how do we engage with industry in a better way so that it's not an internship where you're watching people and getting coffee for them and right. whatever, but you're actually getting paid to do a job and you're doing it because that's, I think, the only way you're going to learn how to actually, you know, for example, let's go back to my photography. Like, I didn't know how to do that. So I had to call my photography friends and like, teach me. I need three weeks. I have a photo shoot and I'm the photographer, right? So they did. And uh, I'm not a good photographer. So luckily I moved on from that. But um, that, those things that I learned made it possible for me to be a a great e-com person because I knew what it took to take a great photo. I knew who to hire yeah. to get that, right? There's so targeted definitely. externships. Yeah. yeah. That makes really I, I good sense. I love yeah. that, yeah. We, we have to sort of come to the idea, so I hear this a lot, industry will always say, well, you guys aren't teaching them the right thing. All right, well, you didn't get them when they were 18 and they thought they knew everything. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and we're like breaking them down slowly to understand that sustainability isn't something you just do overnight because right. it's a great value to have, right? right? Or the fact that they think that you can make anything and have no clue where like the cotton comes from here and then you have to produce it here and then you have to somehow ship it in a container that doesn't exist during that's COVID. Right. Especially for, today. <laughs> right? yeah. So we, we have to teach them those basics, but we can't teach them necessarily the skills. So there has to be on the industry side, an investment on that education piece. You can't assume that Parsons or FIT is going to do all of the training. Again, it's not, it's not, Macy's did that, had, yeah. still does that. Um, they never expected FIT to train a fully formed right. <laughs> employee. Right. Right. Well, every company has their own processes, right. their own ways. Right, exactly. Yeah. And that's the other piece too, when you come to technology, you know, Ralph Lauren and com- they might have a different technology for, um, you know, PLM systems. Right. So if I teach one in, in at Parsons, then if they go to, you know, hopefully the idea is they could switch. Yeah. But a lot of these technologies are so different. They it's, are. It really, there's a lot ever yeah. more in the industry. Oh, so yeah. much. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Are, you know, I'm kind of hearing this. If you're a student looking to um, explore this industry, there really requires a certain level of industriousness to just dive in and learn all of these various skill sets. Um, from an industry perspective, what are some um, things that uh, other movers and shakers in the industry should be thinking about with regards to fostering this new talent? Well, one thing, and it's happening because of COVID, I mean, we're complaining a lot about not having enough people working at retail, yeah. but retail was always like this low paid job. It was. But here's- <laughs> Shocking. Like, <laughs> I did a little bit of it in my you know, I teens. Few, I had a few phrases I won't use on this one, but yeah. <laughs> the only good thing I, is you I'm got some cheaper paid. clothes. Yeah. They paid for your clothes, right? Yeah, you got right. the clothing. Yeah, I got the discount. <laughs> exactly. yeah. But I, I th- most, a lot of people start in fashion and actually even tell my students who don't, go back and work in retail. If you don't know retail, you probably shouldn't be working in this industry because that's where the rubber meets the road, right? Um but I think we have to value that experience. That's where you learn about the customer. That's where you learn about pricing and what people are willing to pay for or mm-hmm. not pay for. That's when you learn about fit and materials and angry customers and customer right. engagement. I mean, you're watching them. You eating while you're standing, <laughs> long out, right. long, right. long out. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't mean that you have to stick in retail, but, um, but I think a lot of the great people in retail, especially if you look at it sort of historically, the the, the, the CEOs of the past yeah, are, right. are all retail people at the end of I the grew day. Up in retail. Yeah. But it forces you to hustle and be creative as well. I mean, I started my more formal retail a little later in life, but oh my God, when you're on that sales floor, like you have to be yeah. so on, you know, mm-hmm. point. Um, 
And nowadays, I think it's even more. I mean, we, we expect these people also to, to shoot and put it up on social media and talk about their jobs on the job and, and engage with customers through apps and all the different things. And they become so much more than just, you know, an 18-year-old kid at the Gap. Right? Yeah, right. they're marketers. They are. And they're good at it mm -hmm. too. And um, so we have to put some value back into that. And I think, again, it goes kind of back to that apprentice idea is giving people opportunity to learn sort of the bigger picture so that when they get into design, for example, they understand that there's a customer at the end of that, right? Or when they are working in terms, if they've been a manager at a retail store, they understand why there's LY, right? Mm -hmm. What Why last year was important. Um, and why increasing your profit year on year, while it's annoying, is also important because yeah. that's how you grow a business. And um, I think that when you learn it that way and you're actually responsible, even at a small level at a store, it changes how you go into the industry. Um, I actually think retail is very entrepreneurial as well. That's the thing, right? You have to hustle. You have right. to hustle yeah. to get your commission. Yeah, <laughs> so right. so uh, I'm not suggesting everyone, we all have to go back to retail, <laughs> but I do think we missed a beat by just saying, hey, Project Runway, everyone can be famous. Let's go out on Instagram and go direct to consumer and just, it, it's not Well, that's the rare reality. exception. Right. right. Yeah. 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 So. Well, thank you so much for all of those insights today, Joshua. I know we could just talk to you for hours and perhaps we'll have to have an encore conversation another time in the future. Really appreciate you sharing your insights on this evolving mm. economy and, um, and it ha the role of education um, with our new talent coming into the fashion scene. Do you have any other final parts of wisdom you would like to share? Sure. Well, for incoming students or people who want in the, it's not an easy industry. Yeah. It's just yeah. not. It's an exciting one, but it's, it's hard. And I think you have to want it. Um, and you're going to have to work long hours. You can't skip, right? Even if you are an influencer and have a million followers at 18, you're going to hit 23 and go, oh my God, I actually now have to go figure out how to manage that's this, right? right? Um, that's number one. And number two is I think, um, especially in the fashion industry, it's evolving so often that you have to keep learning. Yeah. And that goes for the C-suite. Yeah, right. 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 Absolutely. You have There's to. an ongoing education yeah. component you, that's critical. Right, you, can't, you don't know everything. No. <laughs> yeah. Right? Uh, there's just too many new technologies and too many new things and that you are going to have to rely on educating yourself and trusting those that are coming behind you that they might know a little bit more about TikTok, for example, right. than, than this you younger do. generation. And that's okay. Yeah, yeah. this yeah. younger Cheers buying to you generation. For, <laughs> you know, being this guiding light in education, because I think students of today are, have, are, are met with a ton of challenges, and yeah. having, you know, redeveloping the entrepreneurial focus as it relates to education, I think is critical. I think it is important to understand. You know, we in the industry always want our students to be prepared that are coming out, but the reality, to your point that you pointed out today. It's impossible. It's just give them give them some good base components, you know, evolve it, look at technology. There's a number of technologies, and then go out in the real world and yeah, deal with some. Well, you said critical. Stuff. That's yeah. like I, critical thinking, especially in the fashion industry. That's what I mean. As a boss, that's what I'm looking for. If you yeah. can critically think through an idea and understand all the different elements, I can train you. Yeah. But if you come in thinking you can solve everything and have no plan. Yeah. <laughs> It generally doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've been in this 30 years and I still can't. I, exactly. It's like, wait a minute, where's this container? Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, thank <laughs> you so much for this delightful conversation. My Looking pleasure. forward to another one soon. Don't forget to subscribe to Clothing Culture to stay apprised of upcoming episodes.